Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. My name is Richard Acton and we're discussing Octavia Butler's novel uh, Dawn, book one of the Xenogenesis trilogy. Uh, this week we're covering chapters five and six from part two family and uh, I'm playing the role of the uh, mysterious alien experimenter subjecting my co-host to involuntary mental manipulations and generally being infuriatingly withholding with important information. Hello Michael. Hi everyone, Michael Glinka here. Right, shall we start with my predictions from the last time? Yes. So, uh, but before we go, actually, I just wanted to um, talk about mm-hmm. b- briefly about the um, last chapter, the eidetic memory, and I was just thinking to myself, Richard, um, mm-hmm. the idea of like you know being able to remember everything, it's pretty yeah. crazy, don't you think? It's just like being re- able to recall all your memories. I-, I think at some point it would be really difficult to live, don't you think? Uh, quite possibly, yeah. Although, to be honest, I- I'd probably take the trade off. I- I'd like to be able to remember everything in immense detail. It'd be so useful in a number of ways. Damn the consequences. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> damn the consequences. Yeah. Let's go have fun. Well, I yeah. mean, I-, I sort of agree, but then mm. the worst I remember there was. We'll get to this topic later again because of mm. the chapter. But I remember there was a um, there was a show House MD. I don't know if you ever watched it. Uh, oh yeah, with, yeah. Um, what was his name? It was the same actor who played Hugh Laurie. Laurie. Yeah, Hugh Laurie. That's that's the name. Um, and there was this episode about this lady who could remember everything, and she just couldn't live because everything bad or anything that she somebody said to her, she would remember. So she could never just get past that point, you know. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I just thought that it just occurred to me this morning when I was reading this chapter that it's something that possibility to forget things is um, sometimes a blessing. Yes, yeah, uh, distinctly possible. And there are certain things you wouldn't necessarily want to remember, I suppose. But yeah, we'll, we'll come back to some of that because it becomes relevant later in the chapter. Um, so my <laughs> predictions for the chapter five, I just wrote one single line. Lilith and Nikanj mm. are going to be to, gonna be told off. And I think I hit, mm. the, st- hit the stone in it. Yep, I just said yep in my notes for that. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, uh, accurate, I think. And I need to say, this chapter, I mean, there's some, there's, we're going to get to that point, but I feel like, mwah, it was so good. I mean, Kaguya mm. is an asshole, but it's, it, I was, I was so happy with certain reaction there, but we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. Right. So the chapter five, um, we start with um, Kaguya taking Lilith back to the house using one of the slow moving flood vehicles. And on the way, there's not much spoken between them, but um, mm. Lilith internally hopes that although Kaguya is angry at her with her, but he won't be much angry with Nikan because you know it was it wasn't her intention to cause trouble um, for Nikan. And back at home. Uh, when they get Kaguya, just takes Nikanj to uh, Lilith's and Nikanj's room and uh, leaving Lilith behind with Chitaya and Tadin, which we haven't seen for a while. And uh, Chitaya and Tadin are, are sat there eating Owen Kali food, and Lilith kind of notes that it's uh, of the variety that would be deadly to her. Um, and it's just kind of a, a subtle little implication of kind of a threat of, of you know the kind of alienness of her environment i think it, it kind of adds to the the, the tension that Lilith's feeling there it's like a secret sort of message to live oh you're in trouble mm. <laughs> hmm. yeah it's a uh, well conveyed by the text there and then when Lilith asked Daya how much trouble she is in he says well not so much but um she thought that the Uloi Kaguya is angry and Chita, uh, sorry, uh, Chitaya explains to her that it's more oi concern than um, anger and we learn the reason behind this concern is that Nikanj is going through a hard time it's, uh, it's himself and there was a reason beca- behind Nikanj leaving uh, Lilith and just he wanted to fail and um, the reason why because Kaguya is teaching Nikanj and Lilith is part of the lesson of the, you know, his his trial in a way. Mm. And if Lilith wasn't taught by Nikanj, she would be taught by Kaguya. 
which understandably and obviously made Lilith shudder. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, to be honest, if I was, ugh, yeah, I got goosebumps <laughs> then as well. And when Lilith asked why Chitaya, why it wouldn't be him, um, he replies that Uloi handled the teaching of new species. Uh, obviously, Lilith is in preference of Chitaya in that mm -hmm. matter. And this is the point where first time Tadine's actually speaking to Lilith, which is nice, mm -hmm. I think. It's first time to, for, for us to hear her speaking to her. And um, she asks her whether she prefers Chitaya or Kaguya, uh, and with obvious preference to the uh, for, uh, former. Mm -hmm. But when Tadine asks where, if she prefers Chitaya or Nikanj, we, we see Lilith hesitating because, well, she understands that Chitaya left her for that long period of time w without talk to, talking to her, with any contact to her, with her, that she started to prefer Nikanj over him. And, mm. and considering it, it's, it's a child, it's not more responsible for what happened to her and humanity in general than, you know, she was in herself, you know. She didn't have much influence on what happened. And she acknowledges, though, the fact that this whole behavior is basically pure manipulation uh, of her to prefer Nikanj. Yeah, she sort of directly calls them out on that, right? She just says, yeah, you people yeah. are manipulative as, as hell, aren't you? Um, and, you know, Shadai just sort of, like, looks at his plate, his focuses on the eating. It's it's, uh, it's, like, it's a definite... Um, um, yeah, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, kind of... <laughs> <laughs> you hit the you hit the well, you, you hit the bullseye. Yeah, kind of a tacit acknowledgement there. Uh, it's a definite. Um, the whole dynamic with with like the preference for Nakanj and Shdaya is is kind of interesting because the like, Lith I think holds Shdaya more responsible for his actions because he's you know adult, mm. but she still has that kind of Stockholm syndrome thing going on with him where she got used to him first as it were yes yes and then nikanj she doesn't hold as responsible because you know he's still growing up but yeah i'm not sure if the she's she's not sort of overly pleased with any of them <laughs> yeah she just really doesn't like her you know, nikanj doesn't tell her anything Chitaya sort of says oh he will tell you and blah blah and then kaguya mm. is just being a pure asshole so you know it's <laughs> It's 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 not a mix of a good mix, I would say. Hmm. But then we, you know, Lilith asks Daya why, you know, if she is that much of a burden, which again he gets, she gets no reply, which is, you know, hmm. uh, come on, you could just be, you know, more honest about this yeah, stuff. Come on, a little bit, yeah, um, a little bit more but, uh, forthcoming. Yeah, and um, when you know she asks, how can she reduce that burden? How can be less of a problem and uh when i ask what you know what does she want and she says i want paper and right she's like nope not a chance and it's just like okay yeah again why not well nikanj is gonna tell you but nikanj doesn't want to tell me and we, here we are in a perfect yep. loop of yes. no, nobody wants to tell her anything <laughs> tell her anything yeah so go back and ask nikanj again though there seems to be a sort of implication that something may have have changed in what nikanj is likely to tell her Although one other thing I just wanted to note on in this section is that we get quite a bit more just commentary on the like the tentacles and this I, I, I'm saying like tentacle expressions because you know they're on their head they they have these kind of yes expressive movements with their tentacles and we get a lot more detail about that in this section than I think we have previously and I think that it, it's sort of subtly indicating that that Lilith is beginning to learn to read them a little better. That she's noticing these expressions in their tentacles, um, which is something that she wasn't really able to do before. Yes, yes, you're correct. There was um, um, there are some behaviors she still doesn't understand, such as um, when uh, Tadine, when she was asked um, about uh, whether she uh, whether Lilith prefers uh, Chitaya or Kaguya, and she says immediately Chitaya. Um, mm -hmm. She seems to be pleased in a way, though Lilith doesn't understand that sort of movement. I think it's the first time for her to see that sort of movement of those sensory um, tentacles, but we can sort of assume it's being pleased. And, and But I think, yeah, yeah, I agree. This is sort of new thing that she's starting to pick up the subtle behavior um, changes uh, and sort of signs behind the uh, Onkali. 
Mm. Yeah, we we did get the um the explanation that the sort of going flat and smooth was indicate indicative of like um uh, pleasure or amusement. Mm, mm. Um, so that gets called back a few times in these where they're kind of amused or pleased about something by going smooth. But other than that, yeah, it's, it's still pretty difficult to read. I guess not only uh, Lilith think that Kaguya is an asshole, eh? <laughs> I bet that Ian is secretly thinking, yeah, I agree. Tai is better. <laughs> Kaguya is a big piece of... Let's okay. continue. <clears throat> <laughs> so we end up, you know... In the situation where Lilith is being told, no, you cannot, but you will not be told why. But maybe Nikanj mm-hmm. will tell her, and that's where um, Daya lets her into the room where Kaguya and Nikanj are arguing, and then quickly closes the door behind her so she yeah. cannot uh, escape. It's actually quite funny because it's like she turns around and it's like the door already closed, it's closed faster than usual. Than usual, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody doesn't want to be involved in this whole argument, eh? Yep, just get shoved into the room with those two and close. It's actually, you know, it's actually quite funny because it sort of feels more of um, like a normal family now. It it really feels mm. like where you can you can initially towards the first few chapters it felt like they don't express any emotions, and yet in the subtle sort of um, um, behavior of the you can mm. sort of relate in the things you know when you argue with your siblings whatever and suddenly you know like you see your the arguing you just close the door quickly and leave so that you don't get <laughs> caught in in the whole you know war zone yeah. so yeah uh, so uh, yeah you begin to see a little bit more of that kind of uh, domestic family dynamic which is uh, you know, i suppose a little bit humanizing i guess so appropriate word i guess so <laughs> But I, I just find, I found it really funny that you know this whole mm. sort of in a way it's a humor like a humor hidden behind the sort of showing oh actually they're not that perfect but you know they they, they behave similar to us. Um, but anyway, yeah, there are a couple of uh, humorous notes in this chapter. Um, so we enter a scene where Nikanj and Kaguya are arguing really fast in their own Kali language, which. Lilith cannot understand and she consciously sort of stands beside Nikanj to provide you know more support that's like yeah I'm behind your back you know uh, Kaguya can go eat dirt whatever and then Kaguya stops and asks her if she understood anything with it all and Lilith's like nope couldn't and then he asks her slowly do you understand me now and yes Lilith answers now I don't want to read too much of it but I wonder if it was like uh, just do you understand it was just so being slow or it's just being like condescendingly slow you know what I mean uh, yeah I'm not sure although uh, uh, my reading of that sentence initially because you, you can read that as did you understand anything that we were just saying mm. but it's kind of the way it's phrased you haven't understood us at all have you it has kind of broader connotations right so you've not understood what we're trying to achieve here or, or our culture or what we expect of you or what we or the sort of broader questions mm-hmm. that she's not understood um i think that uh, it, it speaks to that as well as having not understood just the immediate conversation so yeah it, it can definitely be be read as being that kind of condescending you didn't understand any of this that we just said and i think it has a, a second meaning but it still comes back to that bloody thing we always we all we said in previous chapters uh that mm. we covered why not just tell her what's the problem like you know understanding comes from you know being explaining things you you know you can mm-hmm. there's one there's so far you can understand from observation but yeah yeah without explaining certain things you know you you know it's like ancient people you know ancient people like you know at the lightning stroke uh, a tree in a certain fire is like okay you know, it could be a weather or it could be an angry god or something in the sky that's hitting the poor tree with lighting. Like, you can't really explain it. That's, you know, just explain. Like, this. but then, I you know, that's, that's yep. one have, reason. They have access people. to the reasons, right? They could just explain themselves, but uh, for some reason they're choosing not to. And yet they still seem to expect her to understand stuff. Which yeah. Is- yeah. But this is where this is, I think, my most favorite part of this chapter, and I think my f- my first most favorite part of the book so far is that <laughs> um, this is where this is the scene. Mwah, it's brilliant. Kaguya turns back to Nikanj and starts to speak even more rapidly than before, and straining to understand, the thought said something close to, "Well, at least we know she's capable of learning." And this, resp- 
response of Lily's response is brilliant. I'm capable of learning even faster with paper and pencil, but with or without them, I'm capable of telling you what I think of you in any of the three le- human languages. <laughs> it's just yep. Ah. Oh. <laughs> And the follow up is great, right? With with Nakanj, he asks what languages, and uh, and she says Spanish and German. And I used to speak a little German. I still know a few obscenities. It's just <laughs> exactly like, the few obscenities I know are enough to tell Kaguya what I think of him. Exactly. <laughs> and the best part is that it makes Kaguya completely just shut up for like a few seconds and just leave. <laughs> it's just like, okay, yep. <laughs> just go. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oh, I was just when I read this, I was like, "Oh, that was, mm, that was so mm. good." After all the condescending behavior of his, just telling him off, like, ah. Oh. But you know, we were left then with Nikanj and Lilith alone, and you know, she goes, "Are you right?" To Nikanj, but he goes, "What other two languages?" As you said, and you know, mm-hmm. um, we learned that she can speak. Um, fluent Spanish and a bit of German um, mm. but we do learn something strange when she uh, when she, um, she was asked by Nikanj why she's not fluent in German but why not in German meaning why not fluent in German because it's been mm. years since I've studied or spoken years before the war I mean we humans we don't use a language we forget it and Nikanj goes no you don't like as if um, it's as if you know the Onkali know that that memory of those um, languages are, or memories in general of this language are still there. You just need to resurface them, which I find yeah. it quite interesting. You know, it's um, I mean, you know, we do recall we humans le- like memorize things the best under when we are emotional, because that's where usually that's that's the way to really um make the um things to remember especially negative emotions because we have quite a lot of areas now in brain that um produce uh are responsible for negative emotions if i remember correctly one specific mm. region is amygdala deep in our brain that's basically responsible for all the negative emotions we have basically so yeah as a highly emotionally fraught situations probably yield the best uh, sort of auto biographical memory and sort of involuntary memorization Mm -hmm. but if you wanted a more kind of uh semantic memory then i think you you wouldn't necessarily get the the best ability to memorize an emotional fraught situation more kind of from from um you know mnemonic practice type stuff i think it depends on the type of memory no no you are absolutely correct but i think what i'm saying is just in general the best memories we usually hold are somehow correlated to memories that have been had some emotions and just i can give you an example of this right i still remember that on the page 264 of a chemistry textbook back in my gcc's um there is a um description of a mineral I remember. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the, the mineral. It was, I think, it was calcium or calcium something. It was a sort yeah. of green mineral, but it had this weird name. And I remember it because I got an argument with the teacher because I said that name to him, and he was like, "No, that's not correct." And I remember that on page two hundred sixty-four, there's the description. I showed him the picture, and I still remember where it was on the top right corner of the page. But that's only because I got emotional about <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I think having the um outliers with respect to various features helps you kind of triangulate in on a particular memory mm. so having a very strong emotional valence or um, apparently um, olfactory cues are also supposed to be very strongly uh, evocative of memory so oh, really? some like odd strong smells will, will take you back to a particular memory very powerfully mm-hmm. that's a, a peculiar stuff memory is really not terribly well understood uh, yeah i mean like you know at the moment we sort of can now i think recently there was a news we can sort of project what we are thinking about onto like a monitor but in a very blurry sort of uh way but still we are way way before <laughs> we can actually understand how everything of that works i mean it's super complicated stuff yeah, we really don't have a good grasp on what I suppose an encoding schema might be an adequate mm. expression, but it's not. It, it doesn't correspond to what that might mean in a in a normal computer science context. Yes, right? it's yes. not a straightforward encoding schema in the in the conventional sense. It's uh, something more 
distributed than that, as far as we can tell. I suspect maybe I'm wrong, but I suspect that if we come up with a way to model this idea of how our brain sort of works, sort of go away from the computer sort of mode of one and zeros, Hmm. but more complicated means that maybe we'll be able to sort of come up understanding. But then again, it's... The lower you go, you know, I mean, it's it's just biochemical cues, but how do those biochemical cues actually make us, you know, the way we're, you know, us having this conversation right now, us mm-hmm. men, right? It's like, we still have no idea how this all starts. We don't know how deterministic sort of the, the those like mid-level processes are, as it were. We, we don't know how much variety there is in the way that different human brains sort of approach mm-hmm. encoding and representing and representing stuff differently mm. um like there, there may be a relatively common set of ways that we do stuff that, that's sort of shared um in which case you know technologies that can attempt to understand you know, it read minds and understands that mm-hmm. converted to something else are, are, are more feasible and they're easier to achieve but if it's if it's more varied if we have relatively highly individual processes there then it's much harder to generalize that into a tool that can translate between what we're thinking and computational representation i guess the problem also lies in the fact that we need this complicated brain mass to actually understand and be able to communicate what we are thinking so that it can sort of help us understand it because we can't really teach a well you know I mean, there have been cases of teaching gorillas and orangutans, you know, to speak to humans in a sign language so that they can convey their thoughts to us. But it's still too primitive to actually understand how their, I would say, lower level brains. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the computer science analogy would be like an API, right? Language is an API for thought. Mm. But we don't know, like under the hood is if if i'm if i'm talking to you using the english api um am i running some c under the hood or am i running some python right it, it, yes. it may or, and you, like you may be running python i may be running c who knows right it's uh, we don't know yet what the the lower level representation are we just know yeah. that we use common apis language and even though we understand sort of how the brain develops you know during the early embryogenesis uh, from the neural crest it's still quite like at which point do we become conscious? I mean, you know, I think that there is a establishment where uh, I think it is being established where the baby becomes um, conscious. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that comes back to the whole problem of how you define consciousness. Yes, because we can't know because the baby will not tell us except for the first time when it's born and it's, you know, crying. But then it's still, does it, is it aware of who it is? At which point it becomes aware of it's itself, you know, but then that, these are hmm. more like metaphysical questions as well. Yeah, and then that, that's the whole point of, is consciousness just the experience or is it self-awareness of that experience? There's a whole, a whole, this, we should probably not go off on that yeah, tangent. Yeah, it's, because... it's probably, yeah, let's, let's not move yeah, on but... from the... <laughs> <laughs> I I am not ready for a full philosophical you know co- debate about yeah. this. I'm not qualified for Probably that. Probably delve into that for an extended period of time because it's philosophy of mind is one of my interested <laughs> in areas of interest, right? So I, don't get me on that tangent. <laughs> we should uh, record one session just you know having this conversation. I'm asking you some really simple questions about this, and you try to explain everything to me. You know, like like a two a five year old. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm no expert, right? I just I, I do a little bit of reading here and there, mm. but yeah. It'll be a good idea to get some experts on at some point about this. It'll be quite fun. Hmm. Yeah, that would be fun. And anyway, let's move on because this chapter is quite yes. long. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we were uh, basically at the point where Nikanj tells that Liv doesn't forget where, you know, those things, and but she's not aware of that. And when she asks about the writing materials, Nikan says no because it has to be their way, just memorizing. Mm. And um, but when Lilith goes, well, if you want to spend two or three times more the time of trying to teach me, Nikan is like, well, actually, I don't want to do that. And we learn the reason behind is because the Kagoya is upset with Nikan because it is not teaching Lilith as it's supposed to. Kagoya wants to uh, wants Nikan to hurry up so that Nikan can mate. Liv realized then that she's not actually an experiment animal. She's actually the final exam of, uh, for Nikanj. 
you know, Nick can't stand sort of scratches itself under an armpit and, and sort of Lily looks and is like, oh, is this, asks him, like, oh, is this the place where your sensory organs will come out? And and she asks, you know, does it come out when there's a mating or before? And you can't tell us actually um, it will come whether or not uh, it mates, but um, we learn a bit more about um, the culture of Onkali here that, that mates, the uh, male and female of Onkali, prefer for uh, the sensory organs to come afterwards um, they made after they made. Yeah, the sensory organs of the uloi with which they're mating. Yes, yes. Um, as he describes, as the males and females mature more quickly, it feels to them they help their uloi out of childhood, and to which Lilith responds, help raise them or help rear them. I think that's a bit messed up, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a weird process. Yeah, and this is where, you know, I live asks if there's a, it'll be a problem, but Nikan doesn't know. He hopes not, but it will go to his to its mates when it can. Yeah, he's uh, maturing before he's sort of completed his, his test and, and Kaguya wants him to, to get on with it, as it were. And actually, that, that led me to a... An interpretation of of Kaguyat's kind of behavior that I was I wanted to float by you, and that do you think Kaguyat's just being awful to Lilith in order to like push her and Nakanj closer and persuade Nakanj and her to just get on with whatever it is that he wants the uh, Nakanj to do, and maybe that some of the some of his behavior is, is is not necessarily just because he's a dick, but is motivated by trying to push them. There might be something. I mean, obviously, as a parent, you would sort of want if your child's development was responsible on the person's um, actions. I'm sure you would try to influence them as much as you can, so that they, your child can learn and do what they need to do as smooth and as easy as possible. I mean, that's sort of any natural, be- you know, response of any parent. I would guess. You know, this is uh, what I would do and what my parents did, and you know, I'm sure you're parents did but so i i can i can see that i can see that uh in him but it doesn't mean that he's not a dick like i mean it's <laughs> you, you could do that with so much such a different behavior you know towards her hmm. just you don't need to you know make yourself the villain to for lilith to um to to like nikanj more you could just basically you know be nice and you know explain stuff and that would be sufficiently good enough as well to for mm. you know to re- achieve the same result you know okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i i like your uh interpretation i mean you know it's like you don't have to be a villain to make you know to make someone mm. to do something you could just might as well ask them and you know usually you, you can come up with a compromise you know that's that's what adulthood is about you know compromise yep yeah, and I, I think there's a a few times in this this conversation where they've they've used the word teach Lilith mm-hmm. things, and I think that there's kind of an equivocation of the definition of teach here, in that I think they're using it in the same way that they use learned in the context of saying that they learned to eat human food, which is to say biologically. And I, I don't think teaching is is just kind of learning the language for them, but entails learning new biological abilities or teaching Lilith new biological abilities and Lilith hasn't quite jumped to that conclusion yet you know what I think you might be right in here in some degree I I didn't think about it this way but considering where the sort of what Nikanj tells um, Lilith next is actually hits what you say what, what you said on spot like it's really something that I did nothing, but it really so, sort of confirms this way. Because the next thing we now learn is that, like a truth bomb, basically, that Kaga is a true asshole, uh, <laughs> where basically he wanted Nikanj to act and say nothing to Lilith and then just surprise her by modifying her brain structure. So there might be is what you're saying about teaching being more a biological effect hmm. instead of actual sort of, you know, conscious involving mind no i didn't think about it it's actually a pretty good point and it sort of now makes me think about the whole what i've been reading so far that different perspective while being saying Mm. you know it's it's a there's a few kind of plays on double meaning in this section i think and even that bit when um 
Lurth talks about the the mates rearing mm-hmm. the Uloi and this sort of like you know, rear kind of has uh, different meanings um, and as and raise kind of has different subtleties to it um, and uh, Nikanj expresses kind of frustration that English has these like weird double meanings but I think there's a bit of I mean, uh, come on! Failure to see that the same thing is true of teach and learn for the the this having this biological connotation yeah. for the for the Uloi. I mean, uh, and the Owen Carly more generally. Yeah. I mean, come on! Like English has f- around four hundred thirty different meanings for the word "set." So I mean, <laughs> I'm not. F- I feel I feel that boy. Like I just honestly mm-hmm. so now I am Nik- I am together with uh, Saul with Nikanj. Just this this together one mind with Nikanj because honestly, it's just <laughs> infuriating in some cases. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, homophones. Don't get me started on homophones. Oh. I, when when I am ruler of the universe, they will be illegal. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Oh Lord Emperor. <laughs> I just hope it's not gonna be a Warhammer forty thousand type of um, uh, empire. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, <laughs> hypothetical, hypothetical empire. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyway, so he Nikan says says her that well, Kaguya wants to change her brain structure, and in the same way that the parent of Chitaya fixed her tumor. And that makes mm-hmm. Lily very happy that it was not Kaguya that was that for his tumor and causing her realizing there's no reason to be grateful to Kaguya at all. And um, mm-hmm. so Nikachu explains to her that would be a puncture per wound and then she would be unconscious throughout the whole procedure. But Liz is obviously afraid. I mean, it's not like she has any mm. disease. It's just normal for humans to forget. But Nikanj wants her to remember, like... It can or Sharad uh, has the ability to, and uh, but you know, but she's scared. Obviously, brain defines who we are, and any sort of damage yeah. to it, you know, what nobody knows what could happen. She has an entirely reasonable um, instinctual aversion to anyone messing around with her brain. Yeah, right? uh, that's. Uh, I, I think most humans would have that reaction, even if you were saying, "Okay, I, I can give you a memory upgrade. It'll be great. It'll be fine." But. Um, can I have some details, yeah, please? Can you explain exactly to me how, you do this? how you can do this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, what's your uh, your past success rate here? Have you you screwed any of these up recently? It's uh, yeah, I, I want a bit more detail before I did the memory upgrade. You know, early, later on in the chapter six, I actually made a note about this, but I think this is a pretty good place to actually mention this. So, I recently read a book mm-hmm. by Doctor Henry Marsh. Um, a neurosurgeon mm-hmm. and under a uh, title do not harm and basically the book talks about the, the struggles that a neurosurgeon and his own history by a lot like it's his autobiography in a way um mm-hmm. about being a neurosurgeon and all the different sort of um tumors that affect uh, can happen in our brains and all those things that can go wrong in our brains and i need to say I, from all the surgeries that sort of, you know, I was expecting that, you know, if I ever was to have a brain surgery mm-hmm. is not something that I would ever want to happen. It's, I mean, there are some things that they, you know, they say um, are easy, you know, all easy tumors, blah, blah, blah. But like in one of his story, he tells about his junior practitioner that it was like a disc um, the disc in the ver- between vertebrae, um, like was dislocated, mm-hmm. and it was supposed to be easy surgery, and the junior practitioner somehow cuts a nerve, and basically uh, causing a um, a complete paralysis of left foot, uh, ankle Oof. down, down, down from ankle, and it's just like, oh my f- god, like. I mean, it makes our jobs that we are doing in the moment really easy in a perspective, <laughs> but it's yeah. just like, you know, this whole idea of Nikanj during a performing sort of a surgery or in a way uh, on Lilith's brain. I mean, like, ooh, I, I mean, after reading that book, I honestly... But at the same time, it's I highly recommend reading that book for every anyone who wants to sort of learn how to speak to doctors when they are about to get a surgery because it really shows okay. like what his process of um thinking was when he was talking to the patients and what sort of you know 
hmm. usual behavior he was observing and you know what things he didn't want to then to uh, ask him so i highly recommend to read this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah ask them all the things they don't want you to yes, ask <laughs> exactly exactly uh. now it just really puts in the perspective that you know in a way doctors think of themselves as separate from the patient but when the doctor becomes a patient they realize that there's this sort of break of that sort of boundary between between you know patient doctor um and yeah, yeah. they sort of you know when a doctor like that needs to get a surgery there's sort of like a connection between both doctors that you know, the one performing surgery and the one being sick is that like oh you know i know what it is now and how it feels for a patient and how yeah and i know that the doctor is gonna try its best uh, his best but, or her best but in the same time I know what can go wrong and a lot of the sort of the neurosurgery stuff again it speaks to that kind of heterogeneity of our different nervous systems oh yes yes you know, we know broadly what you know different regions of the brain mostly do but a lot of the time you know when they're doing those kind of uh, the neurosurgeries where they're you know going to resect some piece of, of brain tissue or whatever the reason they have you awake is because uh, you know the, the they just want to check that they've not yes, like yes. poked a bit of the brain that's doing something important. Right? It's basically just they're just kind of like, okay, we're gonna uh, you know poke this and see if anything bad happens, and then if nothing bad happens, we'll cut that bit out. Um, and it's this whole kind of like super almost improvisational, just like. Uh, yeah, it's it's very unnerving to think about. <laughs> no, honestly, you're on spot. In that book, he describes how it is. You know, he's looking through a microscope, trying to cut away a tumor, for example, let's say. And the brain is surrounded by veins and uh, vessels and stuff like that. So he's literally trying to cut away tissue without touching on the all those arteries because if he does it can damage the brain a bit of oxygen the blood not reaching the brain therefore there's no oxygen and brain dying or cutting as you said somewhere that you no know, accidentally touching and then suddenly the person doesn't is not capable of you know moving their fingers or something's happened or losing some memory or whatever it's horrifyingly mm. scary and you know there are some he say you know that book he says like there are some tumors that are really easy you know they're like sort of um separate from the brain tissue mm. but mm. there are some tumors that you know uh, cancerous uh, tumors that grow into the brain and you can only cut as much as you can but it's still you, you have to leave that tissue because if you cut too much it's literally just you know yeah, it's just interleaved with and almost indistinguishable from the normal exactly. brain exactly. tissue uh, and not nicely encapsulated uh, yeah it's a, a, a problem particularly in, in brain tumors but also in, in other areas like the degree to which tumors are well encapsulated and separate from whatever tissue mm, they're sat in mm. is um, often determinative of how straightforward the surgery is yeah i mean you know if you have a tumor somewhere you know that's ingrained itself in the tissue such as, I don't know, a muscle or, uh, well, I think mm. muscle cancer is quite rare, but like um, intestine mm. or whatever. You just chop off that bit of uh, bit of intestine and okay, that's fine. You can't yep. do that the same with the brain. Yeah, you can sacrifice a large chunk of, of healthy tissue because you can work without it. But with the brain, yeah, you re you really, you don't know which bits you can you can do without because, no. Oh, it, it, it's, it's very inconsistent, right? Because you get people who've had effectively hemispherectomies where like half their brain's been scooped out pretty much and they can be almost normal. But other times, one little thing and the whole thing is just... Yeah. You, you know, you, yeah. It's, uh, there was, um, in that book also, he was mentioning about like when he had patients with um, going either like a tumor being on the left side of the brain or right side of the brain and from my conclusion mm. from reading the book is that as long as it's on the right side you're sort of okay because the left side is the sort of responsible more or less of the sort of logical thinking and stuff like that so it's sort of less dangerous in a way obviously it's not ideal in any case but like that was my sort of conclusion i highly recommend for you to read and anybody else listening to it because it's a really interesting book in general to read from the perspective on neurosurgeon yeah, the 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 notion of the the left side being kind of um i think it's not necessarily just about the kind of uh logical function so on but also about like 
your linguistic interface with other people. Ah, uh, yes, the, yes, yes. The right. left side does kind of a lot of the presentational stuff, but the right side is is still doing quite a lot of work. So I think there's a there's a degree of you might lose a substantial amount of function if you do stuff on the right side, but people are less likely to notice. Yeah, I yes, yes, you're absolutely correct. I mean, you know, it's most of the stuff is like, you know, in past the people thought there were regions specifically in the brain that were responsible for certain things, but we all know it's more interwined. It's it's more co- interconnected. Mm. So it's not exactly true to say that if, you know, it's just right side, oh, it's all, oh, it's fine. It's not, it's absolutely not, but mm. it's less likely to impact you. But then again, sort of day to day, but yeah. then again. As you said, Richard, if it's oh, yeah. like a bit of somewhere that's, you know, cut and you're suddenly gone. So, yeah, um, but the, the whole um, the history with them um, uh, split brain experiments where there's a group of patients who have severe epilepsy where they they severed the corpus callosum, which is the tissue connecting the two hemispheres. So there's mm-hmm. no longer communication between the two halves of the brain. And they did a bunch of experiments with these people to kind of um, figure out like the different respons- responsibilities of the different hemispheres and stuff. Um, and there's these fascinating experiments where they will like provide a cue to just the right half of the brain, um, like I don't know, just you know, get up and walk out of the room or something written on a card that they only show to the appropriate eye, and then the person will like stand up and walk out of the room. And if you ask them why they did it, they'll be like, um, "Because I need to go to the bathroom," and they have no like verbal ability to articulate why they did it, and they won't recall that they had like a card flashed at them, but they will just confabulate. A response that sounds plausible um, that's fascinating to why they did it yeah yeah and the p- people reckon that that's what we do all the time that we we often don't have a particularly good idea of why we did what we just did but we retroactively justify it uh, and there's a, a other work just demonstrating things like um the ability to predict what our decisions are going to be using like fmri imagery a few seconds before we actually make the decision mm-hmm before we become consciously aware of the fact that we've made the decision. And there's a suggestion that we make decisions and then come up with excuses effectively. So rather, rather than like rationally justifying most of the things we do, we just go around making excuses for why we did what we just did. <laughs> well, I mean, half of my life, I guess, I would say. Uh, but no, it's it's. I heard about um, epilepsy, the severing of the corpus callosum, but I also heard about the stories of like sort of alien hand um have you heard about this when uh um, oh, yeah yeah when a person's brain doesn't sort of communicate it's sort of like as if the other part of the brain let's say a right side so your left ha- arm is sort of that um, controls the left uh, side of your body is sort of alien to you so you are you but then part of your brain is not actually part of you so, but, but it acts, you know, and acts on its own. So there's like a case of um, uh, people who who cannot control it, but they can sort of mm. communicate with yourself in a way to sort of, you know. Yeah, it's that, that whole thing of um, the sort of the, the right brain being a bit more non-verbal than the left brain. So if you've got like alien hand syndrome and your, your right brain's in control of your left arm, then you have to kind of figure out how to pl- placate the right half of your brain yes, if you've got yes. some kind of impaired communication between your hemispheres. It's fascinating. It's a, it's a weird one. It's absolutely fascinating yeah. that, like, how... Basically, we cannot touch our brains. Like, the moment you do, you are bound to screw something up. It, it comes back to that, the, the point we are making earlier about consciousness as well, like the whole um, how that's defined and that we think of ourselves as being kind of a unitary singular consciousness but we have these two hemispheres of our brain that are not necessarily always working in concert and and have somewhat separate motivational structures especially if you you know sever the connection between them it's almost as if like it's modular but at the same time it's not those connections Mm. are necessary and impossibly important to each other but in the same time yet they can act modularly it's 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 such a complicated but fascinating topic it's a it's a much disputed question in philosophy of mind. I forget exactly what the the technical term they use for it, but effectively, you know how um, sort of separate consciousness is aggregate. You know, I think it might even they might even call it the aggregation problem something like that. Like if you have these sort of separate lo- loci of consciousness, can, can, how can you combine them into one or not? Like what what's the the mechanism by which mm-hmm. 
that happens. It's it's. I think this topic we could. I, I to be honest, I, it's it's an amazing topic, and I think we could talk about this f- forever. Um, mm. But I honestly, let, I think it's time to move on. But I honestly, cannot recommend more. Read the book about. Uh, Dr. Henry Marsh, the title Do Not Harm, and I highly recommend for everyone because it's something that really puts a lot of things in perspective. I personally don't like autobiographies in general. I'm not really interested in people, other people's lives, but that thing in perspective of an actual effect that, you know, it might happen to people in future or myself in future, um, like a brain tumor or something, hmm. it's something interesting to read. Yeah, medical mem- well, was in particular, I, I often find somewhat compelling mm. in a strange way. <laughs> yeah, there's this great um, part of the chapter when he's fr- get the do- he gets frustrated about the health system in UK, and it's it's quite hard. Uh, like he uses quite harsh words at some point, but I, I honestly mm. read it and then let's have a discussion later about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Where are we up to? We left where about you no know, Liv being scared about you no know, the modifications to her brain being mm. done, and you know that she would lose being herself, and he can't tell her that it won't change um, who she is. Although it cannot make it pleasurable that that whole process of changing the brain structure, she cannot. It cannot make it as pleasurable as an elder Uloi could do, uh, but it's sure that it'll be fine. And when Liv asks, why do you have to test yourself uh, on me if you know you're ready? Which is a fair point, to be honest. I mean, any sort of questions. um... Yeah, that'd be among the questions I was asking. (laughs) (laughs) And then the chapter basically ends with Liv escaping to the toilet again, thinking, what would happen now? Would Nika just follow the orders and surprise her sometime when she's asleep? Or... Would it just turn over her to Kaguya? Or would they both, please heaven, let her alone? That's where the chapter ends. And I think this is sort of... Um, I thought that during that, that brain change, you know, the memory, eidetic memory and stuff like that, um, mm-hmm. the ability to remember everything, There's a. it's called... Um, well, to remember your past memories, it's called hyperthymesia. Yeah, also sometimes called um, highly superior autobiographical memory or HSAM. Okay, and um, yeah. it's it's characterized by spending a lot of time thinking of past and remembering all of your past events, which is not exactly what um, eidetic memory here is. But I thought that would be hmm. it's uh, it's actually it's, it's correlated with um, with obsessive compulsive behaviors. This is uh, one of the, one of the sort of schools of thought is that hypothymesia is kind of a almost like a manifestation of of um obsessive rumination on past memories mm-hmm. and that's part of the reason why it, it uh you, these people remember so well but they, they don't they don't remember like necessarily specific um in individual details usually well they just have a kind of a great ability to retain stuff for a long period of time right so they would remember something from last week about as well as an ordinary person but they would retain that memory at the same kind of quality out for maybe uh, at least a year up to uh, and they they would be better at remembering something that happened to them 10 years ago than you would be at remembering something that happened to you about a month ago so they they, they don't necessarily have um better like uh memory in in like specific mm-hmm. memory challenge tasks in the now but they just have a much greater ability to not forget trivial details i see yeah it's it, but it's fascinating. Like as I and this is sort of brings back to the conversation I mentioned, the, the thing I mentioned very early of the uh, recording, where we um, where I mentioned about the whole idea, remembering everything, and how it would affect our lives, and mm. the whole story about that lady, you know, that show being not be able to forgive people what they said to her because they said something bad, and she was never able to forgive uh, forgive them. Yeah, I think that that is somewhat based on. On, on a, f- a few real cases because i mean this is a super rare condition it's like 60 people worldwide or something but uh, there have been you know, accounts of the small numbers of people who have this uh does suggest that they have a little bit of kind of social difficulty associated with the fact that they just remember everything with extraordinary clarity no i've uh yes that's correct that the character the, in the show obviously it's like a combination of all of them but i will i remember mm. um when that episode came out, um, I, there was a documentary I found on YouTube about 
this lady who could remember. And there was a documentary about several people about you know, having disability. And it was fascinating. Mm. Fascinating that they could remember, you know, what their neighbors did like five years ago or so. It's just like, I don't remember what I did yeah. yesterday. And my goodness, why do I care what <laughs> neighbors did five years ago? But hey, they do remember. Yeah, it's a great um, episodic memory. And that uh, I have a reasonably good semantic memory. In that, like, I remember kind of facts about stuff, but I have a terrible episodic memory. I, if if I set myself a reminder to do something, like I don't know, especially with something I do regularly, like I don't know, water the plants, right? Uh, if I get the reminder, I'll like, okay, yeah, I'm done. And then you know, if I get even marginally distracted between the reminder and actually doing it, I'll be like, have I already done this today, or am I remembering doing it yesterday? <laughs> Like I'll be totally unable to distinguish, even like, if I'm marginally distracted between getting a reminder to do something and whether or not I've already done it. Will just be I'll have no recollection mm. of whether or not I've done it today or whether it was something I did yesterday. It's so like, terrible. I am, on the other hand, a visual learner, where I facts mm. for me do not stick with me unless I somehow <laughs> visually describe them, um, or draw yeah, them yeah. myself, or somehow put them in a like writing and I read them and I see them and then I will remember them then but if somebody tells me something I will not remember that like you can you honestly name somebody and it comes in the tradition it's like goes in one year goes another and generally it's it, it's as you say like reminders I need to put reminder about stuff because I will not remember if I've done something um yeah as I remember stuff based on their relationships to things mm. which I think is why I have a better semantic memory than i do an episodic memory terrible memory for names but uh, yeah like understanding stuff by kind of having the concepts connected together in in uh, you know like a little network of facts about things like people like whilst I f i'm terrible at remembering names i'm usually good at remember I, I know who people are i just forget which label is attached to them <laughs> <laughs> like, like uh, the same thing with other stuff like uh, uh, I often I understand a way some system works, but I've forgotten what all the bits of it are called. I'll just be like the thing that does this. I remember people's faces. Like I can tell I've met someone almost immediately, but if hmm. they go and say, "Oh hi, Mike," I'm like, uh, "Hi," and then my brain is like on hyper speed trying to remember not to look like an absolute dick, not remembering their name. Yep. It's just like, "Oh no, who are they?" <laughs> Apparently, there are two different systems in our brain for facial recognition. There's one that's kind of um, uh, like a an emotional recognition system, uh, kind of a familiarity thing, like I know this person. Mm -hmm. And there's another one that's kind of the more like uh, abstracted intellectual one, that's sort of remembering names and that kind of thing. And there's another one of these like super weird neurological or psychological conditions where I forget what they call it, but effectively, people uh, one of those systems. The, like the emotional system becomes not it doesn't work mm -hmm. properly so they recognize people like they still like this person looks like i don't know my my brother or whatever but they don't get the like emotional cue so they they, they feel like this person is an imposter pretending to be my brother oh okay so they, they're convinced that everyone around them has like been it's, it's like pod people kind of thing like they've been, con been replaced by someone who because they they look just like them, but they don't get the uh, sort of emotional cue to recognize the person, which is uh, sort of one of those other st very strange neurological conditions. Well, it's I thought we were gonna go somewhere else with it because there's another condition where uh, actually I know a person like that um, who will not remember people's faces. You can go talk hmm. to that person; they'll remember, you know, they'll tell you whatever details, and then if you go back and speak to them again. They will not remember you unless you continue hmm. going speaking to them. Then, it's, and actually, I met a person like that in real life, and it's incredible because on the door of the office of that person, that she says, "I do not remember people's faces." I'm like a um, clownfish, basically not remembering anybody's face. Just, <laughs> just you need to tell me who you are, explain you who you were, and what you did because I will not remember hmm. your face. Okay, that's a sort of like the inverse yeah, of that. Yeah. Um, the condition I was talking about, where they've lost the like the the conscious level bit, very strange. <laughs> incredible brain is incredible, and honestly, I want to do neuroscience at some point, but maybe it's better that I didn't. Less frustrating life, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, there's enough without adding the complexities of neuroscience. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right, let's get to the prediction of chapter six. Because chapter six itself is very short, and I think um, hmm. it'll be a good way to end this episode. So in my prediction, I had just put down, yeah, Liv is going to allow her brain to be modified, to remember But That was my prediction. And we get mm-hmm. to that, but, well, let's get to it, to the summary, shall we? Yes. So we start the chapter where we left off in chapter five, where Lilith was sitting in the bathroom. And she's reminiscing about her past, about her husband, Sam, and her son, Ayer. And we actually learn about the events of their death, that during the, uh, at the time, Sam took Ayer to carnival while Liv was taking care of her pregnant sister. And as bad luck happens, a young girl who just got her driving license hit the car with that Sam and Ayer were driving, and which killed Ayer and caused a severe brain damage to Sam. Um, Sam we are told dies three months later, but during that time in between, we learned that Liv, as Liv described it, he was not aware of anything. There was no recognition of anyone. We learned mm-hmm. that some parents went to visit him, and they originally, uh, originally from Nigeria, moved to America, and lived there long enough to have son born in America. But they were not pleased that he met Lilith. They preferred to have him meet someone from their own home country but you know Hmm. usually you know that's not how things go and we are told that they've never seen their grandchild because of that and now their chance for seeing him is gone forever Lilith says that she never knew whether Sam was gone you know her or whether he was aware but couldn't contact with her although she does Hmm. believe that he was lucky to die quickly but never dared to actually say it aloud. And at that point, when she's reminiscing about it, Nikan joins her in the bathroom and, you know, Lilith goes, get out, you know, but Nikan goes, that Kagoya won't be said to him, that humans won't be worth talking to, at least for a generation. But he doesn't know how to be with someone if it, you know, can't talk to. And Lilith says, well, the brain damage is not going to help that if, you know, if I'm not able to respond to you anyway. And But Nikan says that it's quicker to damage its own brain than damage hers. Tells her, but you must trust me or let Owen, Owen being the father or the parent, Mm. um, in this case, Kaguya, surprise you when when it's tired of waiting. When Lilith goes, you won't do that yourself, won't you? You won't spring it on me. He goes, no. Why not? There's something wrong with doing it that way, surprising people. It's treating them as though they aren't people, as though they, are, they aren't they are intelligent. And it really feels ironic that Nikanj is being bothered about it because, I mean, I mean, obviously she doesn't want to be surprised, mm. but so far everything that their behavior was, was treating her like an experimental animal. So, you know, I mean, I personally feel like it's, it's nice sort of Nikanj realizing that, and I feel like he or it's going to be a quite substantial part of Lilith sort of developing and surviving between the and Kali because it's first time when we hear, well, not the first time, the first time when it happened was when Jdaya suggested her that if she wants to die, he will kill her because, she, you know, she asks him. But that was the only time, you know. Hmm. And this is the second time where we find that actually Nikan just does have some sort of feelings towards her that he doesn't want to um, treat her as if she wasn't a human being, or a person, on equal standing with, uh, to Onkali. I mean, he's, he's unwilling to surprise her, but he doesn't seem to have too much of an issue with ultimately forcing her hand, though. Yes, yes. Uh, he, he's, he's forced into the situation of choosing between having it sprung on her by, by Kaguyat or letting Nikanj do it. Although, I just wanted to circle back to the the account of of Lilith's uh, like the, the loss of her, her son and her husband because mm-hmm. that's a it, it hits really hard that it's a it's a really it's a it's a short passage but it's very powerful yes it, 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 you get a, a it's a you know a very tragic uh, series of events you get a, a feel for kind of how uh, resilient Lilith is to have to have gone through this and still be uh, as, as, as resilient as she's is still being in this in this scenario i, I think there, there may be an element of uh having experienced something so uh difficult um is part of the reason why she may have been selected by the Owen kali 
because she has you know a track record of dealing with trauma successfully and they're expecting that she will this handle this as well experience to be yeah similarly difficult no i agree i mean you know it's 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 super hard when you're suddenly your family gone and you know even though she cried mm. and then she she survived it and mm. she managed to go go through it and you know su- survive this whole ordeal and yet you know and now she's in a completely different environment very and now they're trying to do the say like a brain surgery when she knows her husband had the brain damage and it's it's like whew. yeah that the particular bit where you know he he was you know, he suffered a brain injury and he was alive for three months but basically kind of an empty shell not really able to recognize anyone as, and uh, or at least not able to communicate with anyone if he did uh, and then you know he died suddenly of a, of a heart attack uh, at the end of the this this you know, like three month period but uh, yeah she's kind of haunted by the, the, this this image of him just with the uh, empty expression uh, he wakes up kind of you know in a cold sweat with the dream of him like with those empty eyes so the like her particular experience of like seeing someone suffer a brain injury and then spending three months on a on a ward with a bunch of other people suffering from brain injuries and now the uh and carly are proposing to screw around with her brain so beyond the baseline level of don't screw with my brain please which you'd expect from an, an ordinary human being she's got this history of trauma specifically related to that issue uh that uh, she's having to overcome and you know what and then kaguya wants to wanted to surprise her i swear if yeah. you know if if that happened and you know she would wakes up and she's being told what happened i don't think kaguya would live long or i think what would happen is she would probably <laughs> stab it and then the Uloi would probably retaliate with the poisonous glance or even stab her and she would probably die immediately. But I swear, Kaguya wouldn't uh, wouldn't live long after that. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure she would handle that well. Oh no! Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, oh, she she manages to steal herself at the, at the end of this chapter to invite Nikanj to do it. Oh yes, uh, kind of on. Her own terms, I suppose, but well, not really. I mean, the she's the choice is between you know volunteering to to know that it will be done like now, or just sort of waiting to happen for it to happen by surprise. So I mean, it's not much of a choice, but uh, it, it takes a certain strength of character to to bite the bullet. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, after having you know, because she goes to sleep and then she has some nightmares and she just wakes up and goes like, you know what, screw this. If you have to do it, just do mm. it now. And like, it's like you know, like sometimes moments and like it's like it's either now or never. It's just at that point she just okay, let's do it, and she did it. Yeah, that's uh, 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 the sort of uh, you know, someone's if if you have got something like stuck in you, it's just like right, pull it out. Do yeah, it exactly, quick. exactly. Right. It's yeah, better whole, just to do it quick yeah, and then. Get it over yeah, with. instead of like trying to be slow about it, and and then, yeah, and this is where the chapter ends. Basically, down the cliffhanger where she, where um, Nikan just does the puncture as he described to her earlier, and she just drifts away into unconsciousness. And let's see what's gonna happen next chapter. Yeah. Yep, I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. It's gonna be interesting. And um, and my only prediction mm-hmm. is that she starts to she wakes up and sort of like this sort of her or having some sort of dreams and like sort of coming back to consciousness and then she sort of I don't know sort of checks on herself but we sort of start to Hmm. think that she started to bring up thoughts that memories that she didn't maybe she had forgotten maybe she wanted to forget yeah okay that's an interesting one yeah the the whole um like the question around as was alluded to earlier this notion of you've not actually forgotten Mm -hmm. stuff uh you've just not got the necessary tools to recall it for for the most part that's not as far as we understand memory which is not that far often the case right most of the time this notion of kind of suppressed memory is is nonsense right occasionally you can end up with a situation where there's you know some degree of disconnect between whatever the mapping information is and what it is you can recall i mean this we're all familiar with the phenomenon of like having something on the tip of our tongue right we've lost the route to the thing 
but that's kind of the extent of it, right? And when we do remember stuff, we we overwrite it, and we frequently remember stuff that's not quite there. So we 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 seem to have memory in this kind of weird compressed format, and when we recall it, we subject it to some kind of processing to pull out whatever it is that uh, you know we've saved in that memory but every time we do that when we write it back to memory the processed version gets written back not the original as it were right so you you recall it by relay as it were so every time you remember something you write back what you remembered not what you originally had there um which means that you can corrupt the contents of memory yes, uh, yes. and this is a lot of interesting work by um uh, elizabeth loftus on like uh, causing people to have false mm-hmm. memories. Well, I'll remember. You can induce people to remember stuff that just didn't happen, um, and, and it's, it's frequently the case with you know, w- w- um, when you do tests on like visual fidelity, remembering details from a visual image. Oftentimes, we we uh, we put something extra into that image that wasn't actually really there. We remember spurious details. And actually, in fact, if I can interrupt you, is actually one of the techniques used by interrogation. It's one of the interrogation techniques where um, mm. police sometimes, I don't know how often though, I don't want to say often or sometimes, but police do... And it, bad practice. It's a bad practice, but they can make people... It's a technique where you make person think they did something but they never did it that the way they describe it and they they push you and you sort of start to think that you remember what you did but you never actually done it and there's been cases of police Mm. actually you know doing this to innocent people just because they were caught in in as a bystander and then because they didn't Mm. have any better ways to or clues or better sort of um not victims but sort of a person just happened to be a bad time, yeah, yeah. a bad place in a bad time. They just try to, you know, find their own sort of suspect. And this is, and mm-hmm. there is a technique. So yeah, people, people set a high standard by like eyewitness testimony and confessions and all this kind of stuff. And I, mm, the humans in general are super unreliable. Yes. Um, their memories are unreliable. Their, their like consistency of behavior. Uh, people will confess to things they didn't do for very strange difficult to fathom reasons people will uh you know, totally misremember stuff uh, there was a famous experiment that someone did where they basically um they had a guy um like run into a lecture theory of undergraduates with like a fake handgun and like uh, mug the lecturer or whatever i can't remember exactly what the scenario was you know some criminal event mm-hmm. went down in front of all these like undergrads and they got them all to write down like specific accounts of what happened and there's very little agreement on any of the details about what actually happened, despite the fact that they were all in the room watching it happen. Like everything from like the the details of the appearance of the man, the details of the firearm, the details of what he did with it, like you know, everything was completely all over the shop from all these different accounts. Well, I can imagine this being placed. I mean, most of the time students don't actually listen to the lecture, and most of them sleep. So by the time somebody <laughs> runs in, it's usually maybe a a student. That was as late into lecture and just made like so people don't actually pay attention. But yeah, it's it, the the yeah. whole idea of like being able to the, the memorize something and then recall it under pressure because something people will come up with stuff. Just sort of the brain sort of fills up the mm. gaps, and then also the way you are interrogated, what the way your questions are asked to, uh, to you can also influence whether you remember something or not. Very it's, much. So. It's it's yeah. incredibly subjective and hmm. this is something that you know if there's anything happened that you know being you were a um a witness or to something it's and police is there do not speak to them without a lawyer or something because without speaking to lawyer because the moment you are being asked questions that um you're not hmm. trained and that they might ask you a question it might be an innocent question but because you don't remember well, you try to remember. It's just suddenly you are a sus- suspect. Yep. It's like yeah. Or or you can end up doing things like uh, you know, incriminating someone who didn't do something, even if you have a clear recollection of it. There was there's a case. Um, there's this great book by um, Catherine Schultz called uh, "Being mm-hmm. Wrong," I think. And, and there's a she recounts a case of a woman in there who um, uh, effectively wrongly accused someone of being her her rapist but had a 
was like totally convinced she had a perfectly clear memory of this guy she definitely recognized him like picked him out of a lineup um and uh then like sort of you know years later uh she ends up with some pretty incontrovertible evidence that this guy didn't do this um and you know the uh, he ends up being released and they kind of uh, you know um i think i think she she met him and kind of had this you know uh weird experience of of having like been absolutely sure that this guy was was guilty but then being faced with this incontrovertible evidence that he wasn't and that the the reliability of of our of our memory can surprise us right? the subjective impression that we are uh correct is often a poor guide to uh actual accuracy it's pretty yeah. scary isn't it yeah it's, it's pretty alarming but then again you, you do also end up with like crazy feats of memory where people who use mnemonic techniques can do things like recite pi to many many thousands of digits or whatever with extraordinary reliability so we have this peculiar variety of possible like extremely faulty and also sometimes under the right circumstances remarkably trustworthy it's yeah, I mean, I, I, this is this is something that I find fascinating, but also horrifying because a someone can think about it, and often, like when people are shown faces of people, like because often or not, when an event happens, it happens so fast, you only catch a glimpse of someone's face, like mm-hmm. unless they have really characteristic facial features. Usually, people, mm-hmm. I mean, like, are will not be able to. Um, I mean, unless you have a scar or something or, you know, it's it's not going to be easy to pick up someone's face. I mean, like, you know, if you go somewhere in the city and most people have, you know, fair complexion, brown hair, you know, average height, it's just like it could have been any of the hundred people who did it. And, you know, like it's it's hard. Yep. Yeah. And and people look similar. Right. When, when you make larger and larger pools of possible people. Right. So, I mean, the, the ability to to pick someone out of a lineup is kind of dependent on like the background pool of people whom it mm. could be right so it, it, if you've got a relatively narrow set of people who might be suspects then you, you're getting more information out of whether or not you can pick someone out of a lineup but if it's it could be anyone in the city then it's like it, it's much harder to to like, you get much less information uh about whether or not someone is actually likely to be guilty based on whether or not they can be picked out of a lineup with that larger pool of possible suspects because people look alike yeah it's similarly the case for even like uh facial recognition ai it has that problem uh, it can do populations of a certain size but when you start trying to take it broader and looking up people in you know tables of millions it has trouble i think this is horrifying in a way that how can we be sure that whoever, for example, gets prosecuted? How sh- I mean, for most of the cases, you can be sure because, you know, there are other techniques than just um, mm. v- uh, witness um, statements and, you know, there's like case of DNA or fingerprints and stuff like that. But yeah, like... The edge cases where the evidence is very ambivalent. Are when somebody just said very something, hard. or like you know, in ancient times when, like medieval times, when there was mm-hmm. no recording or anything, and somebody would just say, "Yeah, I saw him do it." And, Trial by combat. And it's like, "Yeah, I saw him do it." And the Lord would be like, "Okay, cut him down. That's that solves mm-hmm. the problem." And it's just mm-hmm. wow. I mean, like I that I would not want to live in those times at all. Like the idea of just Except somebody the Monty Python sketch of the witch trial. Yeah, somebody <laughs> doesn't you know like you, so they just come up with an excuse just to get you mm-hmm. cut down. It's just like, yeah, yeah. But anyway, I think this is a good point where we should uh, end this episode. Yes, one one final tangent. Yeah, on the last final for, tangent for of this uh, episode. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this there wasn't much of the science behind, you know, these chapters, but let's see what's going to happen next. Yeah, just some of the memories. Yeah, stuff. next uh, few chapters. Let's see. Maybe there'll be more. <laughs> so we go off less less yes. on less on tangent and, and more on point. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay, then. Yeah, right. thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Thanks for listening. <laughs>